Hey, Crystal, how you doing? Good. How are you? I'm good. Are you feeling good about uh, the election results this week? Yeah. I mean, I am very surprised <laughs> at how it ultimately went. Because, you know, as I was looking at this, I thought Dems might be able to hold on to the Senate. I called some of these races correctly. I did not call the Pennsylvania Senate race correctly. But I just thought, OK, if we look at the polls and we acknowledge we can't really trust the polls at this point, which, you know, we sort of doubly can't trust the polls now that we had a miss in the other direction than what we're used to. I just thought, OK, well, then let's look at the fundamentals. And the fundamentals were atrocious for the Democrats. I mean, you have history weighing on them. You have a low presidential approval rating. You have bad economic numbers. You have high inflation. It seemed like everything was sort of in the closing stretch moving towards the Republicans. And I just thought, you know, this looks really ugly. But then when I would look at the individual candidates and races, especially at the Senate level, I couldn't really bring myself to believe that they were going to be able to to pull it off in all these instances. And obviously now here we sit the morning after we don't even know if Republicans are going to get control of the House, which is not something that I expected to uh, still be questioning at this point. Yeah, I mean, it seems to me like, I have two takeaways from this. I was I was somewhat surprised as well. Um, I, I think there's a couple of points in the I think in some of the exit polling that that hasn't really been pulled out yet. I mean, I saw one stat really sticks out to me that. The Democrats were able to in some Fox exit, Fox News exit poll. The Democrats were able to effectively, in voters' mind, uh, fight the inflation issue in terms of blame to a fifty-fifty draw. This is an incredible yes. kind of stat that basically, when in this Fox News exit poll, it asked people, uh, "What is to blame for inflation? Is it Biden's policies?" It was, I think, it was fifty-two said yes, forty-six said no, which is incredible. Because the media conversation for months, uh, the Republican political argument for months had been that Biden spending money uh, to on pandemic rescue efforts or pandemic relief efforts, et cetera, et cetera. The spending, the Democrats policies created inf inflation. And right. essentially half the country was like, that's horseshit. And like yeah. if the Republicans can't effectively make that argument. That is a that ended up being, in my view, a huge missed opportunity. I mean, essentially, voters rejected the argument or at least half of the country rejected the argument that Larry Summers and the kind of Washington elite have been making that spending to help people uh, is the real problem in the economy. So I, I, I guess I, I I miss I guess I underestimated that. Like I, I misperceived that. I I figured that that the Republicans would have more traction on that. And to be clear, I also think the Republicans, while they criticized inflation, they didn't make a cogent argument about what they would do differently. Right. That's there was right. just there that's was like right. a Republican senator who tweeted out a, just a picture of him at a gas pump as if that's that's the only thing that he had to say. So I guess my question to you then is, knowing this, what do you yeah. think? In a macro sense, the election results say about what Democrats can do, for instance, on economic policy uh, that would prove to be popular. In other words, is there a mandate here that says actually the public kind of likes uh, uh, what Biden has been uh, doing in terms of spending and economic policy? So first, let me echo the points that you're making there, because that was that was what I initially went to as well, is that, you know, I had seen polling previously and I know you did as well, where you would ask people, OK, what do you think this inflation situation is all about? And they're like, well, Jesus Christ, there's corporate profiteering and there's a freaking war going on in Ukraine and we just went through covid. And I should have put two and two together that people were savvy enough to realize, like, this is not all to lay, you know, at the feet of Joe Biden. They sort of recognized the realities of the economic situation and, you know, what was actually causing the dynamics that they were genuinely suffering with um, in their own lives. I think Democrats, you know, I still think they missed an opportunity to make an affirmative economic case. They didn't do that. They leaned all the way yes. into abortion. But who can second guess them at this point, given how historically, you know, um, how historically surprising these results ultimately are. And then for Republicans, uh, this is another thing that I got wrong. Mitch McConnell the whole time was like, we don't need to run on anything. We don't need to have a platform. We're not going to say what we're going to do. And I was like, that's probably their best bet, because honestly, if they did lean into the shit that they actually want to do, it probably would have been even worse for them. But clearly for voters, they saw through the fact that Republicans were railing about inflation, but didn't have 
anything to say to them about how they would fix it, what they would do differently. So that's number one. Number two, you ask, what does this say in terms of the Biden economic agenda, which you know, at this point, he has some wins to point to. Um, you have the uh, the CHIPS Act, which, you know, you uh, are concerned, and I think rightly so, about whether that's going to end up just being a giveaway to corporate America or whether it's really going to bring the jo- jobs back TBD. But I think that's probably popular in the industrial Midwest. Um, you do have the Inflation Reduction Act. You have infrastructure. Um, so you have a number. You have student loan debt relief. You had, um, you know, uh, federal pardons on weed. So you had a number of actual legislative achievements. And uh, Lee Fong pointed out, I thought this was an important note, that maybe part of the strength in the industrial Midwest is that Biden's economic policy on antitrust, on China, on trade, on reshoring has been good for that part of the country. It's been much better than Trump. It's been way better than Obama. And so maybe part of why you see these regional variations is that Biden's policies have been genuinely good for the industrial Midwest. And so of all the places in the country, that's where you see the greatest overperformance. The other thing I would point to here is after Biden did student loan debt relief, you had a whole whole discourse about how working class people were going to revolt over this and it was elitist and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Young people showed up for Democrats in overwhelming numbers. And I cannot help but think that the fact that the Biden administration delivered for a large chunk of them very clearly, materially in you know recent months, and the Republicans were very clearly on the other side of that. I have to think that that also makes a difference as well. Acknowledging, no doubt, abortion, Trump extremism, January 6th, election denial, like those are all incredibly significant, probably the most significant factors. But when you think about how regionally uneven and demographically uneven this midterm election is, I think you have to look at some of those material policies to really make sense of that. I I totally agree. I mean, I think but I would broaden it out a little bit more on the on the youth vote. I mean, if you look at the CNN exit poll, it showed that Democrats won, I think, uh, the, the demographics of 39 and under. So it wasn't just young people who are in college. It's it's the populations that are uh, most affected by and close to and carrying student debt. I That's think right. that can't be overstated. Like I, I think it's now look in the same exit polls, it shows that student debt relief is still only at about 50, 50, maybe 52, 48 in terms of overall support. But I definitely think the party benefited from that uh, in the sense of those were the, 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 the age demographics that really carried the day for the Democrats because above 39, uh, Democrats did not win. Uh, and and of course, above 39, you have uh, uh, voting blocks that turn out in in actually higher levels of turnout. So the party really was buoyed uh, by big margins among young people. Let's let's talk about a couple of these races. I mean, races okay. for high profile progressives, John Fetterman pulling out a win in Pennsylvania, Summer Lee uh, in the Pennsylvania 12th district out in, in Pittsburgh. I saw her uh, oh, during beautiful. my trip uh, to Pennsylvania. Um, she successfully fended off over four million dollars and spending from APAC. Uh, There are new progressive House members like Maxwell Frost, Greg Caesar, uh, Delia Ramirez. Um, Was this a particularly good night for progressives? Because I think a lot of people feel, um, a lot of progressives, rank and file progressive people out there, feel like there hasn't been a a particularly assertive progressive block uh, in the Congress. Do you think that changes now? Um. No, (laughs) I don't think it particularly (laughs) changes. I mean, listen, it's a little bit early for me to look at all these races and really um, sort of suss out like who are the really strong progressives? Who's who said what about different issues? Are they going to be squad aligned? Are they not? Are they going to be more forceful than the squad and like more willing to stand up to Democratic leadership? You know, I think this really uh, this election result really strengthens the hand of uh, the Democratic establishment. I mean, this was phenomenal for Joe Biden, who up to this election, yeah. there were a lot of questions over whether this guy would run again. Would he be the nominee? And it wasn't just the left that was like, oh, we should move on. You have a majority of the Democratic base who's like, we want someone else. You had people like Jerry Nadler and Carolyn Maloney up in New York, you know, longtime Democratic stalwarts questioning whether he should be the nominee next. 
you're not going to hear that anymore. So it really strengthens the hands of the Democratic Party establishment. The things we're saying about student loan debt relief and material policies impacting the electorate, that's not going to be their take- takeaway. Their takeaway is going to be like abortion and democracy. That's all we needed to really do. And that worked for us. And again, it's hard to argue with that case at this point when you look at the numbers, even though I think some of those underlying economic policies end up being determinative in some of these um, key races. So do I see more path for progressives to stand up to Democratic leadership? No, not really. On the other hand, um, going back to the inflation conversation, it really looked like Biden and co had kind of bought into the Republican line about inflation and they were going to be very reluctant to do anything else um, to pass any more legislation that, you know, child tax credit or anything that would be helpful to working class people because they were worried about getting tarred with like you're exploding the deficit and inflation and blah, blah, blah. I don't think they'll be as afraid of that anymore. Now, are they going to have a Senate? Majority, don't know. Looks pretty good, but don't know. Um, are they going to have 51 seats, in which case you can, you know, tell Joe Manchin or Kirsten Cinema one or the other to go fuck themselves? That would be great. Don't know that either. And the Republicans still favor to keep the House, even though, you know, that's in serious doubt. So if you have divided government, they're basically not going to get anything done either way. But I think they'll be sort of less timid about this whole inflation discussion going forward. Um, So, David, what did you take from the Fetterman outperforming Biden in Pennsylvania? I honestly think it was like two things. And I I traveled in Pennsylvania uh, at the last week of the campaign with Josh Shapiro, who ran for governor. My take on that is that Dr. Oz was kind of a uniquely ridiculous candidate. Just (laughs) there's like a just a blatantly ridiculous kind of flavor to his candidacy which I think helped Fetterman. And I also think no one really talked about this, um, that having two strong candidates at the top of the ticket for the Democrats and the Republicans only having one semi-strong candidate at the top of the ticket in that state, I think definitely has ramifications for turnout, uh, for the field program, et cetera, et cetera. So I guess my, my point is, is that Josh Shapiro, the candidate who won for governor, his opponent was not even funded by the Republican Governors Association, was considered so toxic that he, that he didn't get the funding he needed to be to really be on TV at all. Uh, so so the Democratic ticket had two very strong candidates at the top and the Republicans only had really one. So I think that helped F- Fetterman in a huge way. I mean, there's an interesting stat, by the way, I, I, I tweeted about it, which is uh, they asked, you know, is Shapiro, do you worry that he's too extreme or just right? Same thing for Fetterman. The numbers were were opposite. Shapiro was 57% said, you know, not worried about him being extreme. Uh, it, with Fetterman, it was 57% said that they were they were somewhat concerned that he was too extreme. And what I, what I think the takeaway from that is that's the power of television advertising, right? When, when somebody mm-hmm. isn't on TV hammering you every day, as uh, Josh's opponent wasn't because he was, didn't have any money, uh, he was able to kind of kind of rise above it. Fetterman was being hammered every... I was there watching the World Series and it was like literally in the middle of innings, it was like four ads uh, against Fetterman. It's kind of amazing that he survived that barrage. And I think it it bodes really well. I mean, the former state auditor of Pennsylvania uh, told me when I talked to him about the race, he said about Shapiro, he has cut a kind of center-left profile. And he said, which is necessary to being elected in statewide in Pennsylvania. So here's a guy Mm. who's won statewide telling me something that you would never hear in corporate media, that, hey, somebody has to be actually, a Democrat has to be kind of left of center, center left, to win in this very, very difficult swing state. It's the kind of thing you don't hear, but it's the kind of thing that, that I think the election results bear out. You know, I also think there's just like a simple factor. And it is interesting because with Shapiro and Fetterman, They didn't just outperform in like the suburbs or the cities. They literally outperformed Biden in every single county in the state. So it was rural. It was urban. It was suburban. I think you had two guys who both had great statewide profiles that people liked already and, you know, felt like sympathetic towards, which I think for Fetterman became really important once he had a stroke and was obviously clearly still recovering from that. And I think Oz just came off as a dick. You know, I mean, that showed up in the approval ratings like people liked Fetterman and they thought Oz was just an asshole. 
I've got to do a comparison. I want to take a look at the county by county data. But Josh Shapiro said something to me. He said, listen, the way I've won statewide in Pennsylvania in part is it's not just getting big turnout in Pittsburgh and Philly. It's not getting as destroyed as the typical Democrat has gotten destroyed in the red county. So it's like I'm not going to win the middle of the state, uh, you know, 55, 45. The key is to not get destroyed 80, 20. The key is to right. like fight it to 60, 40, and then you can win. I have to take a look at, at whether uh, that bo- that that happened. I, I, I presume it did. Uh, and the key is, is that in 16, when he won statewide in that state, he did that in the red red areas of the state while Hillary Clinton was losing like 80 to 20. And that's why she hmm. ended up losing and he ended up winning in the same year that Donald Trump won the state. And I think there's a lesson there, by the way, not just for Pennsylvania. It's for all of these states. When you're running statewide, part of your job is to do a massive turnout in the Democratic areas. But the other part is to even in the places you're overall losing, the counties that you're losing, it's to not lose by so much. That is a really important and under-discussed kind of factor in these races. Yeah. On the Republican side, the exit polls also show that Donald Trump, obviously a a big factor in people voting against the Republicans. Uh, People, uh, uh, Donald Trump, obviously in the MAGA movement as a whole, uh, seems to be uh, pretty unpopular. This seems to be a, um, a repudiation of that brand. I think regardless of policy, just that that brand Uh, and and of course, Ron DeSantis winning huge in Florida. I mean, to my mind on their side, this sets up Ron DeSantis as if not the presumptive uh, nominee for 2024, then at least in a pretty good position, because what what I've been saying for a while is is and I, I, I. I'm, I'm I'm guessing you agree with part of this, which is that Donald Trump was not didn't become such a polarizing figure over his necessarily his policies. I mean, I didn't like his policies, but Donald Trump kind of, uh, I think, uh, exploded his own presidency through his own brand, through his own. I mean, it also benefited him among the hardcore base of the of the MAGA right. movement. But I think his antics are what kind of got him booted out of of the white house that and 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 covet uh and i think ron DeSantis is the kind of guy who optically can present as a more quote normal version of donald trump uh to essentially evade some of that radioactive maga brand but also he is i think known as a kind of conservative uh a, a firebrand among the maga crowd so it, it seems to me he the republican party has in their view again i'm not i'm not saying this is the best of my world but he kind of presents them with the best of both worlds somebody who has appeal in the maga world uh without yeah. necessarily the negative brand do you think he's set up as as their as their guy i think he had as good a night as he possibly could have had I mean, he romps in Florida. What he wins Florida, which like a minute ago was a swing state by freaking 20 points. He barely won the governorship last time around to Andrew Gillum. And now he completely romps. And at the same time that he's romping in Florida and Republicans across the map in Florida are cleaning up, actually very different from the rest of the country. At the same time, you have the utter implosion of effectively every Donald Trump candidate and almost every stop the steal candidate in the governor's races. With the exception of Kerry Lake, which is still undecided, every single Republican gubernatorial nominee who said they weren't sure whether they would certify the elections in their state or not, they all lost. So it's like as clear a repudiation as you can possibly get and as clear a contrast as you can possibly get if you're a Republican elite who cares about power and cares about the future of the party. Now, why I'm skeptical that Even given that portrait and that landscape, that Republicans, the base is really ready to move on for from Donald Trump. I just the Democratic base cares everything about electability way too much, like obsessively, like turning into little like pollsters and pundits. I don't see any sign the Republican base is like that. They like Donald Trump. They love Donald Trump. They're going to buy. He's going to announce in a week. They're going to buy whatever line he has to say about this election. He'll probably like blame it on Mitch McConnell. The fact that the Republicans did so poorly, they'll completely believe it. He'll get indicted. That will only rally them to him more. So I see a lot of conversation among like the Fox News, which is the part of the Republican intelligentsia, National Review types, Daily Wire types who have always been sort of Trump skeptical 
But do I see that the Republican base is definitely moving on from Donald Trump? I don't see that that's necessarily the case. So here's my concern with just forgetting about who's going to win, who's going to lose. Here, here's my concern. And tell me if you think this is the right concern. My concern is that after this election, like, to be clear, happy that the authoritarians, the election deniers, the fascists didn't win. Yeah. Glad about that. That's a relief. My yeah. concern is that the Republican Party having such an extremist brand and the Democrats winning in the way that they won, which was a fairly weak economic message, uh, mm -hmm. but they were with a, an electorate that was actually pretty smart and didn't blame them for inflation and winning on the uh, abortion issue, obviously, uh, and winning on the kind of appeals to democracy, although that didn't. Uh, a poll all that uh, high in terms of what people thought was important in the election, but abortion did, that this dynamic creates a situation where the Democratic Party, uh, the people who make the decisions of policy and the like, say, listen, we can continue tarring the Republicans, rightly so, as crazy uh, extremists. And we don't really have to do anything uh, more aggressively to really structurally fix the American economy and really to do anything to better appeal to uh, the working class of this country. That mm -hmm. that could be a takeaway that, hey, we've got it. We campaign on kind of cultural issues, non-economic issues, because we can simply anytime somebody thinks about going to the Republicans, we can just say, look at them. They, the Republicans are complete freaks and, and the Republicans are complete freaks. But the problem is, is that that politics then leaves us, I think, in a situation where the economy is completely fucked. Uh, and the they're still nibbling at the edges when it comes to actually structurally fixing it. I, I'm afraid that that politics kind of locks that in. Is that a mm -hmm. fair thing to be concerned about? Yes, absolutely. I mean, that is going to be their takeaway. And again, like with some justification, they have a great case they can make here. I mean, you can look at like, sure. OK, why did why did New York do poorly? Uh, where other states did well. Well, in New York, voters felt comfortable because they had Democratic control of the state House and state Senate that they weren't going to lose abortion rights. And I do think that's a big part of the story of why New York went in kind of a different direction than a lot of the other places in the country. Um, so, yeah, when I watched MSNBC last night for a bit after our coverage, they were absolutely insufferable. <laughs> I mean, they were on there like... <laughs> You know, all these people who said you had to talk about the economy, they're totally wrong. They're ridiculous. Like, obviously, it was only about abortion. And that's the only thing that really mattered here and all this stuff. That's 100 percent going to be their takeaway. There's no doubt about it. So, um, yeah, that's going to be something so things like so things with. like health care. Right. Yeah. So things like health, like there is a massive health care crisis in this country. And by the way, Fox News's poll, it, it has that stat that shows what 65 percent of Americans want some sort of government program, uh, government support wow. to actually extend. That's amazing. I didn't right? even 65%. see that. That's amazing. It's an incredible stat. Yeah, but my point is, is that, you know, and, and I think it was 55 or 60 percent of people generally say uh, they're worried about climate change in their communities, et cetera, et cetera. Like, I think in the exit polling, there is, you see the economic angst. And by the way, that you see the climate angst, but the political dynamics right now are ones that kind of reward not necessarily doing what's necessary to address those massive structural, effectively economic issues. Uh, and yeah. I, I would agree with you, like MSNBC pundits can look at that and be like, haha, see, they don't have to they don't have to do anything. I just worry right. about what that means for like the country, like literally the society, right. <laughs> the civilization. It's so, weird. it's so weird, too, that that would be like something that you think is an own. Like, see, we told you nobody has <laughs> right. to care about these working class people. Right. Like, how dare you? You know? But that right. is that was the reality of what they were saying last night. So um, I'm just, you know, conveying the messaging over the, in that corner. No, I mean, there's also a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy here where it's like if neither party delivers on economics, voters don't expect either party to deliver yeah. on economics. So they're like, I'm going to vote based on the things, the culture war issues that I think they're actually might do something on. Um, so it does become sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy. I mean, I do want to give a. Uh, the Biden administration some credit for the things that they have done that, in my opinion, have been the best are student loan debt relief, which 
Biden really didn't want to do, but he had to promise it on the campaign trail and he sort of got like pressured and shamed into doing it. And I do think that with young voters, that was incredibly, incredibly important. And as you say, I'm, you know, as a 40, almost one year old person myself, I'm calling young voters, anyone under the age of 40 who saddled with student loan debt. I think that was incredibly significant. I think um, the personnel at the NLRB that has enabled the uh, surge in unionization, I think that's one of the most transformational uh, things that the Biden administration has done and the new stance on antitrust. And I, I want to give them credit for those things because that's a, a real break from the Clinton-Obama mode of the Democratic Party. But yeah, I think I think they're going to look at the results and say, well, we don't have to be afraid the way we were of doing anything because of inflation and these Republican talking points. But nor was this, you know, a requirement to do anything. They didn't run on an affirmative economic agenda. They didn't promise anything (laughs) in terms of an economic agenda. So they don't have to really deliver on anything. And even on abortion, they don't actually have to deliver anything. They just have to be not the Republicans and a bulwark against something like a national abortion ban. So on that, too, there's no like requirement that they actually deliver on anything other than just not being the Republicans. So, yeah, that's definitely the lesson they're going to learn. I would agree that there's not a requirement out of this election. I, I'm 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 guessing you agree, too, though, that that each election is a snapshot, that if the mm-hmm. economy keeps having the problems that it has, uh, two more years in, if the inflation continues, et cetera, et cetera, and they still don't have a message, right? I mean, I'm the, I'm one of the believers in the kind of the permanent campaign. I mean, that was a kind of yeah. concept that was made famous by Bill Clinton, right? That you're, even when you're in power, you're kind of permanently campaigning. You're, you're permanently calling out, you know, who, what the problem is and showing yourself as doing something about the problem. I agree. We, we just had an election where there really is no, no affirmative economic uh, uh, mandate, but I also think you're right that there is no uh, economic repudiation uh, or a repudiation right. of what's happened. And so I think it, it, I think it leaves the question of, well, well, what comes next? Right. I mean, if the right. Democrats actually hold the Congress, what I don't I, like, I have no idea what they're going to do. Like, do you have any idea? Like Joe Biden still is president. They let's say, let's say they. I know from some Democratic staffers, they're like freaking out, like, what if we keep the House? We don't have anything planned. We don't have any bills lined up to pass. So they're scrambling to figure they they didn't like contemplate the possibility that they might be able to continue passing legislation. Yeah, I mean, it reminds me of the end of the movie, the famous scene, The Candidate. It's like the most one of the most famous scenes in all of movies where he wins the election and then he says, what do we do now? I mean, like, literally, it's like it's almost like a perfect, a perfect analog, like the Democrats like, oh, we we actually won. Like, we didn't really campaign on much of anything other than to not do what Republicans want to do. But what do we actually do now is a huge open question. And I my I'll just we'll leave it here with my hope. And then I'll ask you for your hope. My hope is that they look back to the American Rescue Plan, which I think on top of the things that you just said about what the Biden administration has done, I actually think that was the biggest tectonic shift that I have ever experienced, I've ever seen in my lifetime in this way, that mm. the idea of spending to help people and, and directly spending into the middle and bottom e- in income tiers is not something that has ever happened, I think, in my lifetime at all. It was a huge break from the Obama administration, from when in its first two years, uh, it was a, a something that Joe Biden himself, a guy who was a Mr. Austerity for a long time in Washington, was not prone to necessarily do. But there was a kind of an aha moment. So my hope is that if things continue to be bad, I don't hope for that, but that they will look back on that and say, look, our polls were high when we did that. We were not re- uh, punished at the next election for doing that. And we should do more of that. W- what kind of hopes do you have? Yeah, I, I hope that they also learn uh, similar lessons and have similar takeaways around student loan debt relief, where I think it's really clear. You can see like, oh, young voters, Biden's approval rating was in the tank with voters under 40. And The minute he did student loan debt relief and a couple other things, it skyrocketed. And then you have young people turning out to vote. And was some of that abortion? No doubt about it. Was some of it? Wow, you actually 
you actually materially delivered for me, like to a, in a life changing way. And these guys are clearly opposed to it. Yeah, I think you have to attribute some of it to that. And then I also think you have to dig into why did we do better in the industrial Midwest than the rest of the country? And when you look at some of the positives from the Biden trade and reshoring and NLRB like an antitrust agendas, those are things that disproportionately benefit that part of the country. So I hope that uh, those are some of the things that they kind of take away that this direction, the, the made in America direction, the lifting the minimum wage for federal government employees direction, that direction is actually paying off for us politically right now. Crystal Ball, the co-host of Breaking Points, one of uh, my favorite people in politics and media. <laughs> Thank you, as always, for taking time with us. Always great to chat with you, David.